Peter Tatchell. Welcome to Trigonometry. Glad to join you. Welcome to Trigonometry, I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is the show for you if you're bored of people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Here at the world-famous Angel Comedy Club, our amazing guest this week is one of the foremost human rights campaigners of the last half century. Peter Tatchell, welcome to Trigonometry. Great to join you. Let's start by asking fundamentally the question that we always want to know about is how did you come to be the person that you are today? And I, I heard uh, you speaking about the fact that one of the things that started your uh, human rights journey was finding out about a man who was going to be hanged in Australia. Uh, and he was hanged, in fact, uh, despite the fact that the evidence wasn't particularly solid in that case. And you said that it kind of triggered in you a, a, a suspicion of authority. And I think that's a feeling that lots of people share. For, for our generations, probably the Iraq war is a good example of something that triggered this lack of faith in figures of authority. But not everybody then goes on to have the, the, the life that you've led, which is being assaulted over 300 times, a citizen's, uh, two attempts on a citizen's arrest on Robert Mugabe, confronting Mike Tyson, of all people, for using homophobic slurs. Not many people go on to risk their lives for what they believe. What was it about your history, your childhood, perhaps, that made you into someone who was willing to stand up for what you believed in the way that you have? I don't think there's any one um, major event or influence, um, but I do know that... Uh, growing up in the 1960s um, watching the nightly television news bulletins about the black civil rights movement in America was a very, very influential uh, factor. Um, it inspired me to, first of all, understand about the horrendous uh, racial segregation and uh, racist persecution and violence that African Americans suffered but also gave me an inkling, an idea about how to do human rights campaigning. So in the last half a century that I've been doing this, um, you know, my model is non-violent direct action, inspired by people like Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. uh, but also Mohandas Gandhi and others. Um, I think their methods of peaceful direct action and where appropriate civil disobedience against unjust laws is the model by which all successful movements for social change have won through. Mm. And, but I'm curious about, there will, be other, there will have been other people who would have been watching Martin, Martin Luther King marching and, and seeing those movements, who would not have had the courage or whatever it is that's driven you to risk your life and limb, essentially, for what you believe in. What do you think it was that made you prepared to do that? to be willing to risk your life, essentially, for, for that. Well, you're right. I mean, <laughs> my school friends uh, also saw the same images right. but didn't act. Mm. Um, I guess I've just got quite a strong sense of right and wrong, um, perhaps an overdeveloped conscience. <laughs> um, I, I don't like to see other people suffering. You know, I, I love freedom, equality, justice. I love other people. I put myself in their shoes if it was me who was being persecuted or unjustly treated, I would want someone to help me. So when I see others suffering, I think, well, if I want others to help me in that situation, then surely I have some responsibility to do something to try and help them. And were you always like that? Were you like that as a kid? If you saw something, some injustice happening as a 10-year-old, would you try to step in or defend people who couldn't yeah. do it? Yeah, and I don't know exactly where it came from. I, I suppose it's partly from my very strict, quite fundamentalist Christian upbringing. Mm. Uh, my parents instilled me in a very strong sense of, um, you know, follow your own conscience, don't just go along with the mob, think for yourself, stand up for what is right, even if it's unpopular. And, you know, from a religious point of view, um, be a good Samaritan, you know, don't walk by on the other side of the street when someone is, is suffering. So I guess that, that, that was part of the fact that impelled me to take up these human rights causes. 
I mean, there must be a part of you, Peter, though, that when, when you see and you, you get involved in these struggles, there must, isn't there a part of your brain going, I mean, we could have had it easier if we just, like other people did, walk on by? Is there a part of you that's like that? Or is, or do you just not entertain that, that sense of doubt? Well, I guess when I see an injustice... I'm aware that I'm not the only person that's concerned. I mean, there are other organisations and individuals who also take up causes. Um, back in the day, you know, you know, millions of people worldwide campaigned against apartheid in South Africa and supporting the internal struggle by uh, black South Africans and their white uh, allies. Uh, they did eventually succeed in overturning that horrendous racist system. So for me, I've also had a very clear understanding that it's collective action that makes change. I mean, I've done a few things, you know, in a personal, individual way, but mostly real change comes about through lots of people getting together and deciding that enough is enough. Mm. So that was the model of the uh, Chartists who fought for working class votes in the 19th century. It was the model for the suffragettes who fought for votes for women in the 20th century. It was the model for the campaign against the poll tax. And Margaret Thatcher's hated unjust, unfair uh, tax on local people. Um, it was through collective effort that change was won. So I've always been part of a movement or in support of a movement. I don't think that personally I've done much myself, but maybe I've perhaps been a catalyst or a voice or a platform for ideas and movements that perhaps hadn't previously received it. Um, what I find fascinating is is your uh, is your desire. Well, desire is probably the wrong word, but the way you quite literally put your body on the line, like and doing a citizen's arrest on Mugabe, not once but twice. I mean, w was that planned? Did you set out to do that, or did you see him and just m m get overtaken by a sense of injustice at this man and what he was doing to Zimbabwe? What happened was that. Zimbabwean human rights defenders asked me to try and do something to highlight his human rights abuses. Uh, at that time, in the late 1990s, there was very little media reportage about what was happening inside Zimbabwe. The arrests and detention without trial, the mass use of torture, um, the burning of houses and crops, um, a really quite gross, tyrannical regime, which the world was pretty much ignoring. So the thinking behind the attempt at citizens' arrests was firstly to act on that request to support the heroic Zimbabwean people who far more than me were taking much, much greater risks to their lives and liberty. Um, but through that process, helping to shine a spotlight on the gross human rights abuses perpetrated by the Mugabe regime. And I think that Although I did not succeed in arresting Mugabe, even though I had a perfectly lawful legal case to have him arrested on charges of torture because I had the evidence that he had condoned and acquiesced in the torture of people in Zimbabwe, um, even though I didn't succeed, those protests did help highlight the immense human rights abuses. You know, th through particularly the image of, of me being beaten unconscious by his bodyguards in Brussels in front of the world's media in broad daylight. I mean, most people have concluded if he's prepared to have his minders beat up a peaceful protester in the heart of a European capital city in broad daylight in front of the world's media, just imagine mm. what he's doing to his own people when no one is watching. So in that sense, it was very effective. Mm. Of course... I never wanted to or intended to get beaten unconscious. Mm -hmm. And I'm living with the consequences with some brain damage ever since. But by comparison to the suffering of human rights defenders in Zimbabwe, I've got off quite lightly. You know, I know activists in Zimbabwe who've been detained for months, even years, uh, without charge, uh, who've been tortured and raped in prison, and some who've sadly being killed by the Central Intelligence Organization, the Zimbabwean Secret Police. So putting it in that context and perspective, you know, I've made some sacrifices and taken some risks, but nothing 
nothing by comparison to the risks taken by and the devastating suffering endured by literally thousands of human rights defenders inside Zimbabwe itself. Did Mugabe recognise you the second time when you tried to do a citizen's <laughs> arrest on him? Um, I think so, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, this guy again. Because <laughs> <laughs> he yeah, must have had a look in his eye like, oh, not him. <laughs> well, see, I ambushed him in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel in Brussels. <laughs> Um, but, 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 but my ploy was, I just walked into the middle of his entourage, um, but I was smiling and held up my hand to shake his. And of course, that uh, led the security staff to lower their guard because they thought I was a well-wisher. And I think initially so did he, because he, 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 he made half a smile and then he suddenly had this horrifying, horrifying look on his face. <laughs> a flashback. Which, which I think was the moment of recognition. So, so it's nice. So it was like a kind of like uh, ethical candid camera almost. <laughs> <laughs> you could put it that way. Yeah. Well, well, it was obviously, as you say, very effective. Another example of where this kind of uh, attempt was effective, actually, I find very interesting you, hearing you talk about confronting Mike Tyson, where you ambushed him. And actually, the way you, the, you told it, essentially, you were able to reason with Mike Tyson. Mm and get him to say to camera that he is not homophobic. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? That I find that fascinating. Yeah, this was in Memphis, Tennessee in the United States, uh, just before his world title fight, Lennox Lewis, uh, uh, Mike Tyson's uh, world title fight against Lennox Lewis. Um, you know, I thought, well, he was you know, on record as making all these homophobic slurs against Lennox Lewis and previous against other boxers. I thought, someone needs to challenge this. And there was also misogyny as well. He was, you know, the allegations or the, the conviction for rape, uh, for which he served prison time, um, and, you know, his, his misogynistic slurs. So I wanted to do something. Uh, and again, it was inspired by people in the United States and some progressive liberal boxing fans who said this is just this is just this kind of behaviour is not what sport's supposed to be about, and they felt particularly bad because Lennox Lewis was getting this non-stop tirade from Tyson. So anyway, um, I went to the United States um, to Memphis. I linked up with um, some local LGBT activists, and we made a calculated guess about where he would be training. We knew where he was staying. Well, we knew, we knew the area where he was staying. We didn't know exactly where he was staying. And we knew that he'd have to go to regular training sessions. So we worked out what was the nearest gym and lay in wait. And um, our guests <laughs> worked out to be uh, on spot on. And he turned up um, and he got out of his SUV with all his bodyguards. Um, then I walked over to him um, and uh, held a placard. I, I'm nervous just listening <laughs> to the story. I'm like, oh. Well, I can tell you, I was very nervous. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to get a lightweight like me. Doesn't want to get a, a blow from Mike, Mike Tyson. No, no. Um, so um, yeah, I walked over to him as he got out of his van and said, "Why are you making these homophobic slurs against Lance Lewis?" Um, and he turned around with an angry face and he lifted his fist. Oh, And I sweet. thought, oh, no. Uh. But then he saw the TV cameras uh -huh. and he just relaxed for a minute um, and then went this rant, you know, I'm not homophobic, I'm not homophobic. And I said, well, but you are saying things that are homophobic. And he said, well, I said them, I don't really mean them. I don't really mean them. Um, I was just trying to wind up Lennox Lewis. And I said, well, you wouldn't find it acceptable for another boxer to wind you up using racism why do you think it's acceptable to use homophobia as a wind up so he got even more defensive but eventually um, there came a point where I said to him look if you're not homophobic will you make a statement to the cameras saying that you're against anti-gay discrimination and sure enough he did and um I can't think of any other boxer or you know, world champion boxer who's done that, but um, certainly not at that time anyway. Um, 
So, you know, that, that was a win. You know, here was Mike Tyson putting on record that he opposed discrimination against gay people. It was incredible. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. And uh, one of the, th the things I find fascinating about that story is you were actually able to reason with him. In other words, you were able to talk to somebody who you wouldn't necessarily expect to be receptive to that kind of communication. Mm -hmm. And you were able to convince him that what he was doing was wrong and to admit it on camera and to stop doing it. Mm -hmm. What do you make of uh, the modern social justice movement and how it seems to be evolving where uh, you've talked many times about the fact that you think freedom of speech is one of the most important uh, human rights uh, and now it seems like it's kind of falling down the pecking order the people are being no platform you yourself have uh, you haven't been quite no platformed I think but there was a lady who refused to speak on the same panel as you because you signed a letter essentially saying freedom of speech is important no platforming is bad it seems like freedom of speech is falling down the pecking order what do you make of that I think it's certainly true that some people nowadays take the stance well if people are bigots or offensive, they don't have a right to speak. You know, they should be barred from speaking, they should be shunned. My view is they should be challenged, their ideas should be countered, there should be protests against them, but I don't think no platforming is a way to make progress because that doesn't make the idea go away, it doesn't uh, convince the person's supporters that a rethink is necessary. Whereas if you engage in a dialogue, which sometimes may be quite you know, unpleasant, but if you engage in a dialogue, then there's a chance that you can present counter evidence to show why these particular ideas are bigoted and wrong. So that, that's, that's my approach. I think engagement is key. And it's not just about seeking to persuade the bigot, because that may or may not work. Mm. What's important about these public engagements is that you engage with the wider public who watch that program or attend that event. So you're really doing two things. You're challenging the bigoted person, but you're also challenging those ideas and speaking to a much wider and perhaps more important audience. Mm. Do you find it quite worrisome nowadays that, that the term free speech is being associated with the far right people like Tommy Robinson or you know uh, Katie, Katie Hopkins, Hopkins yeah. as well and you know when they t and when they support free speech people go you see this is why free, free speech advocates are wrong mm. do, do you find that quite worrying almost I certainly do as somebody whose parents have come from Venezuela well my mother is from Venezuela where free speech is essentially disappearing mm. yeah I think it is a dangerous trend when um people on the right are at least being perceived as supporting free speech. Mm. But of course they don't in reality because they don't support free speech for the victims they're targeting. They want to shout them down, bully them, intimidate them and so on. Um, so what's equally you know, sad and, and tragic is the way in which many on the left um, seem to now think, as you say, that free speech is an expendable bourgeois concept. That you know, <laughs> when it comes to you know ideas that the left opposes, just ban them. Well, that's got echoes of Stalinism. Absolutely, um, I'm and, from Russia. Yeah. I think I <laughs> yeah. mentioned yeah, so yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and you know, it, you know, Rosa Luxemburg, a communist, a German communist, in the early 20th century. She strongly disagreed with Lenin. She said that the right to internal debate within the Bolshevik party and within the wider society is absolutely paramount, that you know, there has to be an opportunity for you know, bad ideas to be ventilated, exposed and challenged. And that was very much an argument against the sort of democratic centralist party line that Lenin and other leading Bolsheviks were advocating. They were saying that we will decide and you all must support this. Um, that dissent was tantamount to betrayal. And Rosa Luxemburg was saying no, dissent is a vital component of an engaged, evolving political movement. And that if a movement isn't open to criticism and to alternative points of view, it stultifies and can often go badly wrong as of course happened in the Stalin era mm. in particular. 
So you would say that, for instance, uh, Tommy Robinson, you do not agree, so you think that somebody like Tommy Robinson should be allowed to speak? He should. Do you think it's... Uh, I'll, I'll put this question in, in, a, in a more concise way. Do you think it was wrong for someone like Twitter to ban Tommy Robinson and to remove his account? Or would you say that ultimately he has a right and he should be allowed to say what he thinks, even if you disagree with it or I disagree with it? Well, of course, I, I strongly disagree with Tommy Robinson and the movements he's involved and associated with. Um, but my understanding was that he was banned from Twitter for simply making criticisms of Islam. Hmm. Um, they are criticisms that I wouldn't make or not make in that way, but I do think it's valid that all ideas, including religious ideas, should be open to criticism. Um, when it crosses the line to abuse and insults, when it uh, engages in threats, menaces or harassment, and certainly if it involves any element of encouraging violence, mm. then that is obviously clearly wrong to step too far and that should not be tolerated because it's not about, that's not about free speech, that's a, a violation of free speech because when you have that kind of toxic atmosphere, which Tommy Robinson has often been associated with, I'm going to say, um, you actually close down debate because the targets you know, Muslims, immigrants, refugees don't feel able to speak out and engage in the debate because they're intimidated, they fear the consequences. So for you, the line on free speech is essentially, I, I mean, you, you kind of put, from my, what I took out of that, is you put insults and incitement to violence into one category. Uh, is, well, that, is that where you are? Or mm. would you say you should be allowed to call someone names, but you should definitely not be allowed to incite violence against them? In a free society. Yeah, I, I think insults are okay. Mm. But again, it depends on what kind of insult. So um, when it comes to free speech, I've got three red lines. Um, the first is, I don't think someone should be able to make false damaging allegations against another person. For example, to falsely accuse them of being a paedophile or right. a tax fraudster. Um, equally, I don't think it's right that a person should be able to engage in threats, menaces, or harassment. And finally, um, I think another red line is incitements or encouragements to violence and murder. Mm -hmm. You know, those are criminal offences and quite rightly are not part of what constitutes free speech. So outside of those three red lines, you know, I think people have a right to speak, but equally people have a right to protest against that point of view. Um, I think it's really important that there is uh, no free pass given to people who promote hatred and bigotry. Of course. I mean, that's absolutely fascinating. Peter, well, one question that I wanted to ask you, I mean, do you think with the right of people like Trump who are openly espousing racist views or racist points of view, uh, I mean, Brexit, which I'm not saying that everyone who voted Brexit is racist, of course, that's absolutely wrong. But nevertheless, there were certain undercurrents to the Brexit campaign. Do you think we are regressing somewhat with our, um, you know, with our tolerance in this country and, and our levels of tolerance? Or do you just think that, you know, with the advent of social media, that people, more and more people are able to contribute their voice? Well, I think social media is great in that it does give a platform a voice to millions of people otherwise would not have it. So that's a really positive element. But of course, um, a lot of the interchanges on social media are quite toxic mm. and actually very bad for people's mental health and you know, are not free speech. They are speech that's hateful, um, you know, often making uh, fabricated allegations. So that to me is damaging and undermining social media. But where I strongly disagree is with people who say, that's offensive, you can't say that. I mean, some of the most important ideas in human history have caused great offence in their time. You think of Galileo Galilei, uh, Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx. They all had ideas that many people found deeply offensive. And if this uh, rule that you can't cause offence applied, then those great people would have been shut up. And I don't think that's the right way to go. I think that's, um, th that would 
create a, a cultural stasis where new radical dissenting ideas could be shut down on the basis that some people found them offensive. And is there a part of I'm just curious because you know you spent you dedicated your life to fighting for these causes. Is there a part of you that gets that's I mean you seem like a very reasonable and gentle and kind man, but is there a part of you that gets really pissed off when these people are refusing to speak on a panel with you calling you transphobic, calling you racist when you've been standing up for for the rights of uh, ethnic minorities and LGBT people your whole life? Is there a part of you that goes how dare you? I guess there is. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it is par for the course, sadly. You know, you just have to take the brick bat um, and, and, and carry on. Obviously, you know, you try to counter them. I try to counter them. But, um, you know, there is a tendency now among sections of both the right and the left, uh, among some people, um, to try and discredit other people by smearing them as racist or a neocon, you know, they think that's that's a, that's a way to damage you rather than engage with the arguments of the ideas, rather than look at the evidence. You you you, you the tactic is to smear and slur, and that's very damaging for democracy because if that's how democratic debate descends, then people cannot make decisions or come to conclusions based on facts. It's this mishmash of fact, fiction, smear and fabric uh, lie. And even the conversation you had with Mike Tyson would not have been possible if, if it had just been about labels. You actually had a conversation where it was productive, whereas if you just called each other names, that would not have happened. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a really good example of where he said something offensive, but rather than run away and cry, or rather than, you know, denounce him, I went and engaged with him and got him to make a positive pro-LGBT statement. And what do you make of this whole clicktivism that where people are now trying to change the world as you've tried to change the world, but they're doing it one Facebook post at a time rather than <laughs> <laughs> one campaign at a time or actually doing something? Yeah. What do you make of that? But I think social media activism, online petitions, they have a valid role, um, but they're usually only effective if you get 100,000 plus signatures or even several million. Um, I think a lot of people do seem to think that clicking the mouse is, <laughs> I've done my bit. Yeah. yeah. And you know, thank you for clicking the mouse, and some of those mouse clicks do have an impact. But really, an effective campaign is much bigger and broader than that. It's got to involve much more interaction, much more engagement, and that means a combination of protest, writing letters, lobbies, a whole host of different things. Well, writing letters is a very British solution <laughs> yes, to the problem. Yes, it is. It is yeah, it's an incredibly British solution to the problem. I was because, because, like, you know, if someone gets a letter, you know, um, they are more likely to take it seriously than if they get an email. Does it matter about handwriting? Probably uh, does. It yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A handwritten letter will will probably get an even better response. <laughs> um, but you know, if all you can do is type or send an email, <laughs> well, okay, do it. There's but, only but, so far a man can go. <laughs> if you take nothing from this podcast or this show, please remember: if you want to protest against something, calligraphy is a way forward. <laughs> <laughs> but even that, yeah, that's not enough. You know, people can write letters, but mm. you know really effective campaigns, like the campaign against the poll tax mm. in 1990. Uh, it won because, yeah, people did sign petitions and write letters, but the real uh, impetus for Margaret Thatcher dropping that policy was that millions of people either refused to pay the poll tax or delayed payment, so the system became unworkable. So using that financial leverage mm -hmm proved to be a very, very effective way because Thatcher ultimately realised even though she said this was a flagship policy, there was no negotiation, she wasn't for turning when it came down to it so many people made the poll tax unworkable that she had to recant and, ab uh, and abandon it I mean one of the stories that blew me away Peter from reading about your career and I was actually talking to um, a gay Australian comic yesterday and I was telling him stories about how you used to at the very start of your career in the 70s you used to go 
into Australian bars where they they were you know they they were ho- openly homophobic and engaged in sit-ins, and. No, that was in London. Oh, so, oh sorry, it was in London. Stop smearing Australia. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> apologies. But no, it just in bars in London which were open and engaged in sittings. That, to me, absolutely bl- blows my mind. I mean, did, did you ever... I mean, you must have enge- encountered some incredible people during those moments. And Were you genuinely fearing for your life at certain points? Not with the sittings, no. But, um, yeah, in the early 1970s... It's true that there were some bars, restaurants, pubs, other venues that would not serve gay people. So, model on the black civil rights movement, Mm. we decided to organise sit-ins in those venues to demand to be served. And when we were refused, we sat down and refused to leave. And then, of course, the police were called and we were arrested. But we didn't have to do this for too long you know, it was just a matter of weeks, really, when most of these venues eventually gave in because we told them, you know, you can have us arrested and carted out once, twice, three times, four times. We're still going to come back until you agree to serve gay people. And eventually, most of those landlords and managers realised that they were onto a loser, that we weren't going to go away, that, in fact, our repeated sit-ins were actually driving away their traditional customers. So they were losing money. And of course, money talks. Mm. And so eventually they gave in and agreed to serve us. So why did the Iraq war campaign fail? I mentioned this at the beginning, that for our generation, it was a defining moment. Certainly for me, it was a moment when, for the first time, I realized even if millions and millions of people around the world come out onto the streets and protest about something, it's not going to make the slightest bit of difference. And the Iraq war has been something that's defined the the years yeah. since. I mean, everything that's happened has been, what, 15 years now? ISIS, all of the stuff we're still dealing with, Syria, Iraq, they're all consequences mm-hmm. of that war. Mm-hmm. And despite the fact that millions of British people and people around the world came out onto the streets, it just went ahead. Mm-hmm. Why, why do you think that failed? I think we had in this country um, an arrogant smug, self-satisfied and unresponsive government led by Tony Blair. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) And, um, you know, most, you know, democratic governments do have a a sensitivity towards public opinion. And when public opinion is so overwhelmingly against an action, most governments in democracies tend to, you know, withdraw or revise their policy, but not Tony Blair. Um, the problem was that we didn't have any leverage other than the mass protests which he was able to ignore. Um, you know, in the case of the poll tax campaign, there was the financial leverage of non-payment or delayed payment. We didn't have an equivalent. If we had, we might have got the government to change its stance, but we didn't. So that war went ahead not only on the basis of uh, a lack of public support but also of course based on a big lie absolutely peter just going back to the issue of gay rights do, do, you must be very very proud of everything you you, you and you know, the, your supporters and activists of, of the changes you've made for gay people over the last 30 to 40 years it's it's, it's a huge achievement what what do you see as as, a, as the next struggle for gay rights in order to to achieve fairness and equality? Well, there are still some residues of anti-gay prejudice, like the fact that um, half of all LGBT kids in schools are bullied. A third of all LGBT people in the country have been victims of homophobic, biophobic, or transphobic hate crimes at least once and sometimes three, four or five times over their life. Um, So, you know, the battle is not won. You know, we've got legal equality in most areas. Um, Public opinion has changed. You know, the the level of public homophobia is much less than it was uh, two or three decades ago. But globally, 
that's where the real battle is because still we have today 72 countries where homosexuality is totally illegal uh, punish you up to life imprisonment in some countries and facing the prospect of uh, even the death penalty in 10 Muslim majority countries so I mean, that's that's definitely something that to fight for. What do you um, make of uh, you know? I come from Russia, as I said. Uh, what do you make of the situation? Because you've been to Russia and you've in fact, uh, you think you've been assaulted in Russia. That uh, welcome. What do you make of the situation there? Because that's one country that seems to be actually getting worse, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, although homosexuality was decriminalized in the early nineteen nineties under Boris Yeltsin. Mm. Um, there, there was a window period where things seemed to be getting better. Um, certainly in the Putin era, things have gone very much in reverse. Um, you know, I think Putin and his party have seen homosexuality as a useful political diversion. Um, you know, LGBT people in Russia are sort of portrayed effectively as the enemy within which of course distracts Russian people from the massive theft of public assets by oligarchs, um, the huge corruption of Putin and other leading Russian officials, um, and the, the, the widespread human rights abuses in that country. So it's, it's a good diversionary tactic in the same way that, or similar to the fact you know, that in the 1930s in Germany, Jewish people were used by the Nazis as a, as a, as a way of deflecting German public's attention from the crimes of the Nazis and their own failings. So that, that is definitely a, a, a backward step and we have seen actually the legislation passed in 2013 which criminalised the so-called propagation of uh, you know, homosexuality which in effect means anything positive or informative about gay issues uh, falls within the criminal law. So people have been convicted um, under that law for holding up a placard saying homosexuality is normal uh, or just gay rights. Um, you know, ostensibly it's targeted at protecting minors. Well, why do young people need protection from homosexuality? You know, some of them will be gay. They need support and information, not, not, not the, the image or the impression that it's something shameful, wrong or whatever. Um, but also, of course, um, you know, this is very much a product of the alliance between the Putin regime and the Russian Orthodox Church. So we're essentially in Russia today, uh, Putin supports the Russian Orthodox Church and in return they support him. And the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, plus some of the uh, Muslim organisations also, have rallied very much to demand a crackdown on homosexuality and they were some of the prime movers behind the legislation in 2013. So yeah, things are going backward. And on top of that, of course, you've got the rise of a social media in Russia which is being exploited by far-right extremists to target gay people. So uh, far-right extremists will pose as gay, lure gay men to rendezvous, and then beat them up, um, you know, humiliate them by shaving their head or um, pouring ink over them, a whole host of, of humiliations. Um, but, you know, that is going on with, I wouldn't say state sanction, but certainly de facto state sanction. You know, th there's no action being taken by the Russian state to close down those direct um, manipulations of social media to perpetrate criminal acts of violence. Do you ever find yourself, Peter, I mean, you come across as a wonderfully tolerant man and very, very, very gentle, for want of a better word. Do you ever find yourself, though, getting frustrated and angered by certain aspects of organised religion which seem to condone um, homophobic behaviour and even encourage it in certain mm. instances? Well, I'd say that organised religion is probably the single greatest global threat to women's rights and LGBT rights. Um, all over the world where LGBT rights and women's equality is under attack, it is motivated primarily by religious establishments. Not necessarily 
people at the grassroots of the faith, but the religious leaders. So here in Britain, we have the Church of England, the official established state church, uh, which opposes equal marriage. It says that gay people are inferior and not entitled to the same right to marry the person they love as heterosexual men and women. So that's, you know, an official endorsement of legal discrimination by the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Um, all over the world, um, you know, everywhere from Russia to Uganda, Jamaica, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, it is religious motivation that is orchestrating the systemic persecution of LGBT people. And why do you think that is? I mean, you must have some theories of it. Why do you think that they're, they're, they're so homophobic? Because, I mean, I, I was raised as a Catholic. My mother, like I said before, is Latin American. And Latin American culture, I mean, is, is deeply homophobic. I mean, like, for instance, to, to tell you a story, um, my cousin, uh, when I was very young, in the early 90s, he passed away from an AIDS-related illness, and he was a gay man. And in that time, David didn't bless him. He didn't. No one could admit that he died of an AIDS-related illness. He died of throat cancer mm. because nobody wanted to admit that mm. he was gay and died of AIDS. Why? Mm. Why is it? Do you think that these organisations are homophobic? Because to be honest with you, I mean, I'm, I'm straight, but it still makes me incredibly angry. Mm. Well, I think all the major faiths are deeply patriarchal. You know, very. Uh, much based upon male power and privilege. And we see that, you know, across the world, um, most faiths still have male-only clergy. You know, women are not allowed to be imams uh, in Orthodox Islam. Um, it's only recently that Judaism has opened up to women. And apart from the Church of England, the Episcopal Church in America and a few others, um, most Christian denominations are overwhelmingly uh, led by and ruled by men. And I think for a lot of men, um, regardless of faith, a lot of men, um, not so much in this country now, but a lot of men traditionally, have been very threatened and insecure about their own sexuality and have therefore targeted uh, other gay and bisexual men. Well, this is what I was going to ask you, and I, it's a bit of a weird question, so please understand that it's it's meant uh, as, a, as a genuine curiosity. Uh, growing up in Russia, I Russians generally are very homophobic, and I, I heard all this stuff about how the reason that people discriminate against pe gay people is it's not natural. That was the thing that was said. And one of the things that actually, if you look at the facts... Homosexuality is as prevalent in animals, in many animals, as it is in humans, right? Do you have any idea of any evolutionary theory that explains why that is and the kind of the evolutionary rationale for homosexuality? Do, do, are you aware of anything like that? No. No? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that is the big conundrum because, of course, um, Darwinian theory of evolution um, talks about the survival of the fittest and, you know, the reproductive capacity is very much about survival right so why would this um set of factors combination of genes and hormones and and social factors why would it predispose every known human society to have homosexuality mm. um but to me that's an interesting question it's not essential to no, the way we live not. our lives mm. so i'd love to know the answer too but um what's really important right now is to end the persecution of LGBT plus people worldwide. Of course it is. Moving on to another topic, I know you're very passionate about electoral reform in this country. Could you give just explain to us a little bit about why that is and the problems with our current electoral system? Well, just so everyone knows, I mean, I am best renowned for my work on LGBT rights, but I've always very consistently also campaigned for other human rights as well. And to me, one very important human right is the right to vote in elections and for that vote to count. Now, in Britain, um, no governing party has won a majority of the popular vote since 1931. Mm. Wow every single 
UK governing party since 1931 has come to power on a minority of the popular vote, mostly between 35 and 43%, a clear minority. So it means that none of these governments has had a genuine popular mandate. None can say that we speak for the majority. But of course, under our electoral system, repeatedly they've won a majority of seats. So Margaret Thatcher won a landslide in 1983, but it was only based upon 42% of the vote. Tony Blair won 55% of the seats in 2005, but it was only based on 35% of the vote. You know, that clearly is not democracy. That's not what the Chartists and the suffragettes fought for. You know, they fought for a representative parliament, and we don't have one. You know, millions of people's votes do not count. You know, it, it all depends on marginal swings in marginal constituencies. Um, you know, there's been elections where a change of 15 to 20,000 votes would have changed the election result in terms of seats won and governments formed. You know, out of millions and millions of votes, it swung on just 15 to 20,000 votes in key marginals. Now, that is not a way to run a democracy. That's not a way to have a government that has and inspires public confidence. And that encourages political parties actually not to speak to the majority of the people, but yeah. to target very particular constituencies, very particular types of people within those constituencies. Absolutely. If you, if you look at Cornwall, for example, mm. in the southwest of England, um, l less than half of the voters voted Conservative, yet the Conservatives won all the political representation for the whole of Cornwall. I mean, how can that be right? You know, that's why we need a system, some system of proportional representation like they have in Scotland, Northern Ireland, in Wales, and in the London Assembly. There, it's not perfect, but there you do have a more representative um, governance. So, for example, in London, um, there's always been two or three Green members of the London Assembly. Um, now, the Greens never won any seats in the constituencies based on first-past-the-post, but under the top-up system, they won enough popular votes to get them two seats. And they have had incredibly effective and, and, and out-of-all-proportion influence on policy in government. You know, most of the major innovative policies uh, pursued by successive London mayors were initiatives that originally came from the Greens. Now, I'm not saying that just because I'm a Green Party supporter, but I'm just saying it's a good example of how when you have a system of proportional representation, you do get a wider spectrum of public opinion represented. And even if those are just minority seats or minority representations, they can be highly effective and they can actually make a very positive difference to people's lives. Sure. Well, the, the interesting question there is, uh, the, the Lib Dems, if you remember at the time of the coalition government, they campaigned on the referendum for some kind of... They couldn't quite get PR, so they went for some kind of PR. The alternative like, vote, yeah. The alternative vote. Which is not PR, but... Yeah. And no one really voted in that referendum, yeah. and it didn't go through. And I think there is no appetite in the general public here in Britain for that system, or indeed it seems for PR. I mean, how... Uh, how oh, no, no, public opinion is now very strongly in favour of okay. reforming the voting system. Uh-huh. I mean, it's probably not at the top of people's agenda, probably the NHS and jobs and sure. education at the top. But if you ask people about, you know, should Britain have a fair voting system? Does the voting system need to change? You know, clear majority say yes, yes, So yes. why hasn't it happened, Peter? Because the big two parties have a vested interest in keeping the system the way it is, because they benefit from it. You know, Labour's view is we'll keep the system the way it is, eventually we'll win a majority <laughs> and, you know... We won't have to be bothered about doing, <laughs> doing, doing coalitions or alliances with other parties. But to me, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very strong and uh, very sincere socialist. I, I believe in quite radical socialism, but I only want to see it happen if I can persuade a majority of people 
that it's the right thing to do. I don't want to sneak in socialism uh, as a result of an unfair, unjust, undemocratic electoral system. And I'm sad to say that many people in Labour want to exploit the unfairness of the system so that they can get a majority and force through their policies, even if they don't have popular support. So we just have this tribal political system and the two tribes are warring and they don't want anyone else to get in on their yeah, action. Yeah, so, well, here we are. The three of us here, you are one of the most prominent and effective campaigners in recent history. How do we fix this? How do we organize a campaign for PR? I'm, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> you, you, you've got one supporter, right? Yeah. How do we do it? Well, I have advocated for many years that the campaigns for voting reform should carry on with the tactics they're currently using, but also do suffragette and charter style direct action. Peaceful, non-violent direct action to demand a fair voting system. But sadly, those organisations are too timid. Mm. You know, they, they don't want to go down that road. Uh, the closest they've come to it is we did a hunger strike for voting reform earlier this year. But, you know, a hunger strike, well, OK, it's, 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 it's a gesture. It's making a point, it's saying that I feel so strongly about this issue that I'm prepared to go without food and endure the discomfort. But it's not real leverage. Um, you know, I think, you know... Do we need a citizen's arrest of Theresa May? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> but I think we, we need more than that. We, we need a mass movement. And we need a mass movement that, um, like the suffragettes and the chartists, is prepared to um, be challenging. Non-violent, but, but challenging. Is part of the problem that it's not really a sexy issue? You know, you're not going to throw yourself under a horse carriage over PI. It just doesn't... doesn't... Well, Emily Davidson did. <laughs> <laughs> true, yeah, yeah. true. Um, so... Yeah, but you, you're, you're right. You know, most people think politics in terms of issues that directly affect them and their lives. So, you know taxation, social security benefits, the NHS, education, transport, the environment. These are the meaty issues that preoccupy people. But we're never going to get those issues right until we fix the voting system. That's the point I was going to make. So how do we convince people to get on board with that idea? Because I've been thinking that PI is a much better system for, for, for decades now, really. So ever since I discovered how the parliamentary system in Britain works. I mean, it works, right? It's better than certainly a lot of the con the countries that we come from, absolutely. But um, there's not necessarily a healthy comparison if you're trying to create a good democracy. Uh, how do you get ordinary people to get that link that you've just exposed there, which is that if you want to fix a lot of the social issues that we keep talking about and a lot of the practical issues, we need a better representative system. How do you convince ordinary people who, who live busy lives, they've got kids to bring up and lives to live and work to go to and whatever, to go, ah, without this, we don't have this? How do, how do you convince ordinary people of that? Well, just as you, as you put it, you know, we need to explain and argue that unless we have a fair voting system, we're not going to be able to address the issues that you care about because a majority of people in this country are broadly left of centre, do support social programmes and public services, but their voice is not being heard in government because the voting system keeps on delivering governing parties with minority support. So um, when it comes to how we move forward, I think it's a combination of education and persuasion, uh, direct action and protest, online petitions, a whole host of different things. But at the end of the day, what is going to convince people if, is if they can see and understand that without PR, the things that they want to see happen won't happen. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, if we'd had a system of proportional representation in Britain in the 1970s, Margaret Thatcher would have never been elected and she would have never won those successive election victories because every time she did so based on a minority of the popular vote, only just over 40%. So for people on the left and centre of politics who probably in most cases loathe Thatcherism and what it did to this country, 
you've got to ask yourself, well, you if you didn't support PR, that's why you ended up with Thatcher and all the devastating consequences that followed. So if you want to change things and prevent a new Thatcher, you have to support a new voting system. And what I find very frustrating right now is that Labour is so far not supporting a fair voting system. You know, they want to keep things as they are. They want to benefit from the manipulation of the first past the post that gave uh, David Cameron and Theresa May a victory, Margaret Thatcher a victory. They want to benefit from the same system to give Jeremy Corbyn a victory. And to me, there is no socialism worth having unless it has majority public support. You see, Peter, I can see why you, you, you never made it in politics. It's because you're far too principled. That's <laughs> yeah. the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, far too principled. Listen, now, we've got time for a couple of questions. One of the things when we put out the fact that you were coming on, uh, one of our viewers wanted to ask, uh, how do you remain so hopeful? Uh, because you must be hopeful uh, to have lived the life that you've lived. How do you remain hopeful in in the face of tragedy and horrors and also just the kind of things that we've just been talking about, you know, the pol a political system that ignores the voices of many, many people. How do you maintain a sense of optimism and hope uh, when all of that is happening? Well, I guess I am an unreconstructed 1960s idealist. You know, I grew up in an era of great optimism about what could change and how we could change it. And I've seen so many changes in my lifetime, which of course inspires me to keep campaigning. Um, you know, I think about terrible injustices such as the systemic legal persecution of LGBT people in this country, which is now history. And I, with many thousands of others, was part of that process of change. And I think to myself, wow, I helped do something that has made life better for vast numbers of LGBT people in Britain. Um, you know, I look at the global stage and, and, and have seen so many dictatorships fall in my lifetime. There are still dictatorships and even new ones, but you know, Franco is history, Pinochet is history, Marcos is history, um, the old Soviet Union is history. Um, you know, these are momentous changes which have been brought about by millions of people organising to fight for that change. And so I, I just I feel inspired by the changes that I've been part of and feel hopeful that further change can come. And I know that if we put our minds to it, we can change things. Not always and or not always immediately, but but ultimately no tyranny lasts forever. You know, Adolf Hitler promised a one thousand year Reich, it lasted all of 12 years. Um, there are many others in, in power, perhaps not direct tyrants, but you know people perpetrating great injustice. Um, they won't last forever. They will have their day and be gone. And that just keeps me want to keeps me keeps me want to fight on and help bring about that change. We have to end it there. Yes. What a way to end it. What, end the show. what a wonderfully uplifting, beautiful way to end the show. Um, Thank you very much for coming on, Peter. We always ask the final question, which is, what is the one issue that you think is incredibly important but people aren't talking about nearly as much as they should be? Do you think it's... Well, obviously, we've covered PR. Is there something else that is particularly dear to your heart? For me, economic democracy is the elephant in the room. Um, we live in Britain and Western countries um, in an economic dictatorship where the rich and powerful have all the votes. It's not one person, one vote in the economy. The directors, the major shareholders, the managers, they have all the votes. And ordinary people are excluded and disenfranchised. Um, so when it comes to the running of both private corporations and public institutions like the National Health Service, they are run on quasi-authoritarian lines, top-down, the people who work in those institutions have little or no power. And that strikes me as being totally out of kilter with our political system. You know, in politics, we expect democracy. We expect one person, one vote. We expect a rich person to have no more votes than a poor person. But that's not translated into the economy. 
So my ask is, if we expect political democracy, why not economic democracy too? Why can't we have a system, for example, where private corporations and public institutions would be required by law to have, say, one-third employee and consumer representatives on their management boards with full rights to information and full voting rights to make it a more co equal partnership between the people at the top and the grassroots. And you've got to remember that the people who work in both private and public institutions at the grassroots, they have a vast wealth of practical knowledge about how those institutions work, how they could be improved, uh, lots of things, but their voices and their contributions not being heard. So it's not only an issue of fairness, it's also an issue of uh, making those uh, workplaces and institutions operate more effectively and efficiently. So, you know, I'd love to see, you know, the grassroots porters, nurses and doctors in the health service have a direct input through an elected representative or more on the management board of their NHS trust. So they could take to that management board practical ideas for about improving the service and to have patient representatives as well to give their voice to say this is how the hospital needs to change its operating system to make it better for patients and for the delivery of care. Now the German Works model, the G German Works Council model is an example of that. I'd, I'd go a bit further but it's a good example and I'd say that in Germany um, first of all employees feel they have a stake in the company because they've got representation on, on the Works Council board. Secondly, uh, when they have a grievance, they take it to the board and often it gets resolved. They don't have to go on strike. So you're not losing production through strikes. Um, your productivity is better. The company's operation is more efficient and employees feel better involved and rewarded because so often when those issues are taken to the Works Council, uh, there may be some resistance and some argy-bargy, but in the end, often as not, there'll be some compromise and the workers in the end will make a gain. That doesn't happen in Britain. You know, we're too polarised. But it should. And in the 1970s, under the Labour government of Jim Callaghan, there was a report produced by Lord Bullock which proposed a very similar system. Sadly, sadly, the left and the trade unions shut it down. They said, this is corporatism, this is like, you know, nobbling the unions. That's madness. Imagine if trade unionists or employees had direct input to the management boards of their companies. They could address their grievances in the boardroom, not on the picket line. They could take their message direct to the people who had the power. They could have a vote and they could perhaps persuade some of the managers and shareholders to vote with them. So to me, it is so obvious that we need some system of economic democracy. It's good for the economy, it's good for fairness and social justice. And there we go. What a wonderful Interesting question. Interesting idea. All right. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate you spending this time with us. If you enjoyed watching this episode, do follow us on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, give us a rating on iTunes if you prefer to listen. Follow us on at TriggerPod on Instagram and Twitter. And we'll see you in a week's time from now. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.